here. David Bonson joins us here. He's the Chief Investment Officer for the Bonson Group. David, again, John Tucker was looking for some theme to talk about here in this market. I don't see a lot here. We got a ton of earnings going on out there, but it seems to be everybody's just kind of waiting on the Fed. I, you know, I don't know. What, what are you guys? What are you guys looking for in terms of direction in this marketplace? I always am looking for company earnings and actual activities from from the businesses we invest in. In other words, a day like today is the way it's supposed to be. You know, the market's <laughs> trading around the size of the briefcase Jay Powell carries to a press conference. It strikes me as very unhealthy. <laughs> market's trading around Simon Property having a blockbuster earnings result last night. Now that makes a lot of sense. So you see uh, uh, the largest mall operator in the country up four and a half percent today. It was a name I talked about with you guys yep. last time I was here. Um, that, you know, we're bottom up people. We're, we're markets, our businesses doing things kind of people. I'd like to see less of the obsession with Jay Powell, quite frankly. Okay, so then what do you like? Like what's working bottom up? I think bottom up, you have to look at the spaces that are not overvalued, even though some of those overvalued names have done well. It's not been the quarter everyone seems to think it has for Mag7. But Tesla's gotten crushed and, and uh, Microsoft had, you know, good results, but not a great stock result. Um, Facebook had a huge upswing yep. on a dividend announcement. It's been very mixed. We're looking at things like consumer staples that we think are showing their pricing power growing dividends and if it is going to be a boring year uh that will be a good thing for does that mean that you sell tech or you just don't want to buy them here well for us we don't have to worry about selling it because we didn't buy it to begin with and so you, so you don't own any of the big mag seven or six not a single one and so that's why our that evaluation call david or it's totally valuation call. These are seven of the best run companies in history that have done extremely well and they have a blended negative return over the last two years and I don't think people realize that because 2023 was so good, yep. but it was mostly just offsetting what was so bad in 22. And we think that's what it's going to do. That's what companies that trade at 30, 35, 40 times. You know, Facebook right now has a higher forward multiple than it does backward after exactly. last yep. week. That's just crazy. So what do you, when you, how do you screen for stocks? What's important to you guys at the Bonson? Dividend growth. So it starts with companies that have a dividend higher than the S&P. Generally, we want 100 basis points or so higher than the S&P, but then a track record of growing the dividend. From there, that's the screen, as you asked. Yep. Then we start doing our work. Then we have to research. We want management that's committed to the dividend, committed to growing it year over year. They can only do so if they have a company that has recurring free cash flow. So if the free cash flow or the business model itself lends itself to lumpy earnings, it may not be a good dividend payer. It has to have a strong balance sheet. It's a little bit more boring. You get a lot in healthcare. You know why we did so well last year was financials. The asset managers, Blackstone was up over 80%. Apollo and Blue Owl were up 50%. Even though consumer staples and healthcare were laggards last year, but again, on a two-year basis, they're beating everything else because 2022 mattered. So that's our approach, and, and we don't try to time in and out of it. Um, I don't know if NVIDIA is going up another 50% or not. I do know if it does, it's multiple expansion. And we do not invest on multiple expansion. We invest on free cash flow growth. Do you like big oil? Well, I love oil, small, little, medium, and big. Um, but in, oh, you found a friend here. The, yeah, I think that I think that that's where you get the great dividend growth. That's what I was asking. And, and I think that the week. Biden administration policies are very favorable to big oil and very unfavorable to small oil. They're not allowing a lot of new projects, which makes the projects that Exxon and Chevron already have in the ground much more valuable. Make enables them to go buy Hess and Pioneer respectively, and their Permian market share is just exploding. So both Chevron and uh, Exxon we think are great plays, but they're not our biggest energy exposure. It's midstream. Mm -hmm. So we own an ETF. The ticker is UMI. It's actively managed, has about 18 different pipeline names, export LNG terminals, but it's actively managed around that midstream energy infrastructure story. Last year, energy was down a couple percent. Exxon was down a little. Chevron was down nine. Midstream was up 16 percent. The MLPs were up 25 percent for the third year in a row. So we we do like the midstream energy story. What gets you to sell a name? Is it they cut the mm -hmm. dividend or they just say they start doing stuff that might put the dividend at risk? Cla cash flow or something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, those are all good answers. It, can, it could be opportunity costs. There was a company, Cardinal Health, we bought yep. for about 50 bucks. It's in a fantastic dividend grower. It got to 110. They continued growing the dividend and they were executing 
But at that point, we got five years of return in one year, and we just exited simply to be able to pursue better opportunities. Uh, we're selling MetLife today, as a matter of fact, and that's a name we've owned for a few years. But it's a company that is not growing its dividend in cash, but it is growing at dividends per share. So we're getting more dividends per share, but they're just paying the same amount because they're buying back so much stock. We, when they're buying back three times as much stock as they are paying dividend, we don't like that. But when you, your question about if they cut the dividend, do we sell it? It's our job to not let that happen. We need okay. to be in front of companies that will cut the dividend. And some of the sort of career making moments for me were deciding against the grain to sell companies we believed were at risk of cutting the dividend ended up being right. So later. how do you identify those companies? You just see their free cash flows maybe s slowing or? Yeah, my favorite story of all time is 2007 Citigroup when they continued to pay the dividend and then were borrowing $12 billion from right. Saudi Arabia. You say, right. you know, I, this is, doesn't look right to me. And right. I think, yeah, when free cash flow goes negative and the dividend keeps going, then they're basically taking advance on the credit card to pay the dividend. So do you get heat from investors, though, in terms of not buying, big, not being in big tech and being in big oil? Because that's like the reverse of what the cool, trendy thing, ESG thing is. Um, that's a really good question, but we actually don't take heat for it. But a lot of that has to do with self-selection of the client base. The types of people that like working with us might be more predisposed to that. But also we're incredibly communicative. We explain why it isn't. It, it, there's a certain ideological bend in this. Obviously, there is on the ESG side. Mm -hmm. For us, we really believe we have a fiduciary duty to find the right investment opportunities for clients. I'm not against big tech ideologically. I'm against big tech not returning cash to shareholders. I think that uh, it is absolutely inexcusable that Apple is paying tip money out to investors when when they're making more cash in, in a year than most of the S&P makes in, in a lifetime. It's just, um, to me, it's an unfair treatment of shareholders, but I understand the argument. Um, you know, there's always people who ask about it, but look, Netflix was up a thousand percent last decade and it gave back all of that return in about six months in 2022. So I'm a child of the 90s. I grew up beginning investing money professionally in the 90s. I saw what happened. Cisco today is sitting around 50 it was $80 in 1999. And it's, one, and it's grown earnings and profits and revenues every year. It's executed perfectly. It was just plain overpriced. And when you buy something that overpriced, you risk decades of lost return. We're just unwilling to take it, that risk. So what's, what do you think is a, what's a dividend yield that screens well for you? Do you, is it by industry, by company, or do you say I need at least a two and a half percent yield or something like that? Yeah. I mean, universally we tend to want about two and a half just to start, but there's some sectors where that wouldn't be nearly enough. The portfolio blends to about a four handle yield okay. and that's more than double the S and P. Um, and so you're going to end up with some higher yielding names, Simon property, Lamar advertising. Oh, These I are love Lamar to come public. It's a wonderful, wonderful the company. Riley Brothers. Wonderful company. You talk about shareholder alignment. Family owns so much of yep. it. They're going the dividend every year. Our midstream energy stuff is over 5% yield. So you get some higher yielding names. You're going to have lower yielding names on some of these ones that it's just priced in. You know, McDonald's, I think we talked yep. about last time. That's a lower yield now only because we're up 600% since we bought the stock. Same for Walmart. Walmart uh, went public the same year I was born. They've grown the dividend every <laughs> single year. So you end up with a lower yield right now but our yield on walmart and mcdonald's is like 40 percent on purchase we're getting 40 percent year over year from what oh. we bought the stock at that's what the whole point of dividend growth is i said like based up 30 seconds right are you competing with money market funds in terms of getting money in clients? No, uh, you're always competing with the risk-free rate in, in um, the fact that people have to bench it against something, mm -hmm. but they're not people saying I'm considering either money market or a dividend portfolio. It's a totally different risk profile. It's true in a macroeconomic sense, but it's never true in a microeconomic sense. Mm. Good stuff. How's the weather out in your, your next Here we world? go. I knew Here's this Here's the was thing. Coming. Sitting here in Manhattan, the sun's out. It's beautiful. It's a little chilly. California having the worst rainstorm that they've seen, which of course there people wouldn't even, you know, around the country, they wouldn't consider it a storm, but in Newport, they'll probably end up canceling school for a month. Well, I saw some of the video coming. It's, really bad. It, it's, it, it's pretty, it's pretty bad. They've gotten a lot of rain. It's um, a little worse inland, but yeah, they, you know, we get this like once every hundred years. Yeah. All right. So good, hopefully good snow up in, in Tahoe for the skiers. Uh, David Bonson, thanks so much for joining us. David Bonson, uh, Chief Investment Officer, Bonson Group. Uh, dividend yields. That's one of the many reasons we like to talk to David because it's a strategy we don't hear enough about. It's true. So, but also just how the risk profile is factored in when you take a look at the S&P dividend yield and sort of how to manage that. Yep. I think that's interesting.